The last interpretation of probability that we're going to look at is known as the propensity interpretation. The term was coined by the philosopher Karl Popper in the 1950s. Actually, before we get into the concept of a propensity, let me just back up and situate this discussion a little bit. We've looked at a number of different interpretations of the probability concept, but you can carve up interpretations into roughly two camps, corresponding to two larger umbrella concepts of probability. The first concept is sometimes called epistemic probability, or inductive probability. Ian Hacking calls it belief type probability. This kind of probability is about how probable a statement is, or how strongly we should hold a belief, given certain facts or evidence. Given such and such evidence, what is the probability that the Big Bang Theory is true, or that it'll rain tomorrow, and so on. The key thing about this kind of probability is that it doesn't depend on unknown facts about the world. It only depends on our available evidence. Probability judgments of this kind are always relative to the evidence that is available to some agent. And looking back at the probability concepts that we've discussed, it's clear that logical probability and subjective probability belong in this camp. But there's another probability concept that we've also been discussing, which some call objective probability or physical probability. This kind of probability is associated with properties of the world itself, independent of available evidence, independent of what anyone happens to believe about the world. So, for example, when we hear reports of an outbreak of a new flu virus, we're told that in certain regions there's an increased chance of contracting the virus. And if this is true, it's true independently of what anyone happens to believe about the world. Or think about radioactive decay, where there's, say, a 50% chance that a particular atom of some element will decay in the next hour. The half-life of a radioactive element is an objective feature of the world that we discover. It's not something that depends on the evidence or beliefs that we have about it. Of the probability concepts that we've looked at, classical probability and frequency interpretations of probability belong more to this camp. Now, admittedly, the physical properties that are associated with probabilities in these theories are a little weird and abstract. In the classical theory, they're ratios of favored outcomes over all equally possible outcomes. In frequency theories, they're relative frequencies of observed or hypothetical trials. But in both cases, the probability of a coin toss landing heads is identified with the feature of coin tossings, not with our beliefs about coin tossings. So what does this have to do with Popper and the propensity interpretation? Well, propensity interpretations land squarely in the objective physical probability camp. Popper introduced this concept because he thought that frequency-style interpretations of physical probability weren't adequate. So he was trying to articulate the concept of a physical probability in a better way. So what's the difference between relative frequencies and propensities? Let's consider our coin tossing example again. On a relative frequency interpretation, the probability of the coin landing heads is identified with the long-run relative frequency of heads. So in the long run, this frequency will converge on 0.5 for a fair coin. And this limiting frequency, this ratio, is what we're referring to when we say that the probability of heads is 0.5, or 1 half. In other words, a probability on this view isn't a property of any individual coin toss. It's a property of a potentially infinite sequence of coin tosses. Now, Popper thinks there's something incomplete about this approach. Now consider two coins. The first is a fair, unbiased coin. The other is a biased coin. It's weighted more on one side than the other. So when you toss it, it lands heads more often than tails. Let's say that in the long run, it lands heads three quarters of the time. Popper asks us to consider these two coins sitting in front of us on the table. These coins will generate different long run frequencies when you toss them. Why? What explains this difference in behavior? The obvious answer, says Popper, is that the two coins have different physical characteristics that are causally responsible for their long-term frequency behavior. It's these different physical characteristics that Popper calls propensities. It's their different propensities to land heads that account for the differences in their frequency behavior. And this is what numerical probabilities are taken to represent, propensities of an experimental setup to generate these different relative frequencies of outcomes. Now, an important feature of these propensities is that they belong to individual coin tosses, not to sequences of coin tosses. Propensities are supposed to be causally responsible for the patterns you see in sequences of coin tosses, but the propensities themselves are properties of individual coin tosses. So on a propensity interpretation, if you toss both of these coins just once, you can say of this singular event 
this individual coin toss, that the unbiased coin has a probability of 0.5 of landing heads, and the biased coin has a probability of 0.75 of landing heads. Popper and other propensity theorists take it as a major advantage of this approach that it lets us talk about single case probabilities. And it has a theoretical advantage in that it explains the long-run frequency behavior of chance setups, rather than just treat them as brute empirical facts, as frequency approaches tend to. Popper also thought that a propensity interpretation was the only way to interpret the probabilities associated with quantum mechanical properties, like the decay rates of atoms. He interprets quantum mechanical properties as measuring genuine indeterminacies in the world, not just our ignorance of the physical details that actually determine when the atom decays. According to standard interpretations of quantum mechanics, there are no such details. The quantum probabilities represent genuinely indeterministic processes, an objective chanciness in the laws of nature itself. So Popper thinks that the propensity interpretation is the most natural way to interpret these kinds of physical probabilities. Okay, that's the basic idea behind propensities. As you might suspect by now, this is of course just the tip of the iceberg. We haven't said anything yet about possible objections to propensity interpretations, or even whether they're a viable interpretation of the probability calculus. I mean, maybe propensities can help us understand objective indeterminacy in the world, but what's the guarantee that they'll obey the mathematical rules of probability theory? And how exactly do propensities relate to relative frequencies? And what exactly are propensities, metaphysically speaking? All of these questions are interesting. And in the decades since Popper introduced this approach, various different theories of propensity and objective chance have been developed to help answer these questions. I'm a little hesitant to get into this literature because A, it's mostly of philosophical interest. This is something that scientists or statisticians tended not to have much interest in. And B, I don't want this introduction to be any longer than it has to be. In an introductory classroom discussion, I'd probably stop right here. But, since I talked about objections in all the other tutorials, I might as well say something about how this approach has been developed and the sorts of challenges it faces. So here goes. First of all, there really are two kinds of propensity theories in circulation. And these theories differ in how they view the relation between propensities and relative frequencies. For Popper, for example, the probability of landing a 2 on a dice roll is interpreted as a propensity of a certain kind of repeatable experimental setup, in this case the dice rolling setup, to produce a sequence of dice rolls where, in the long run, the dice lands a 2 with relative frequency 1 and 6. So on this view, propensities are always associated with long-run relative frequencies. They're precisely the physical features of the experimental setup that are causally responsible for those long-run frequencies. So on Popper's view, even though he talks about single-case propensities, these propensities are only defined for single cases that involve some repeatable experimental setup. And the physical property associated with the propensity is defined in terms of its ability to generate these long-run frequencies, if you were to repeat the experiment over and over. Notice that this is not a propensity to produce a particular result on a particular occasion. This is a propensity to produce a sequence of results over repeated trials. For this reason, some people call this kind of propensity theory a long-run propensity theory, and they distinguish it from a genuinely single-case propensity theory which treats propensities as propensities to produce particular results on specific singular occasions. I know this might seem like just a verbal distinction, but metaphysically the two views really are quite different. For example, for a single case propensity theory, the propensity for rolling a 2 on a fair dice roll is relatively weak. It's measured by the ratio of 1 in 6, or about 0.17. That's a low number. The probability is a direct measure of this weak tendency, or propensity, to land 2 on a single dice roll. For a long-run propensity theorist like Popper, on the other hand, the propensity for rolling a 2 on a dice roll is not measured by this low number. It's not identified with the probability of rolling a 2. The propensity for rolling a 2 is a very strong, extremely strong tendency, but not for rolling a 2. The propensity is the tendency of the dice rolling setup to land 2 with a long-run relative frequency of 1 in 6. And that is a very, very strong tendency. So we have the same outcome as with the single case propensity approach. The probability of rolling a 2 is defined as 1 in 6, but the interpretation of the physical property that is responsible for this outcome is very different. Now I draw this distinction because objections to propensity theories differ between these two types of theory. As I mentioned earlier, one concern that all interpretations of probability face is whether they can function as a suitable interpretation of the probability calculus, the mathematical theory of probability. Long-run propensity approaches tie propensities to relative frequencies, which is good in one sense, 
since it can piggyback on the widespread use of relative frequencies in science. But from a foundational standpoint, it's not so good, since, as we saw in the tutorial on frequency interpretations, there are reasons to question whether relative frequencies can provide a suitable interpretation of the probability calculus. With single case propensities, it's even less clear why we should think they would obey the laws of probability theory. Of course, if we wanted to, we could define single case propensities in such a way that they necessarily satisfy the laws. But as Alan Hayek puts it, simply defining what a witch is doesn't show us that witches exist. So simply defining propensities in this way doesn't give us any additional reason to think they exist. Another class of objections focuses precisely on this question of existence. Unlike relative frequencies or subjective degrees of belief, which aren't metaphysically mysterious to most of us, it's not at all clear what propensities are, metaphysically speaking. The closest category we have to describe physical tendencies of things is dispositions. Certain kinds of physical properties are, are dispositional properties. Think of a property like fragility, where we can think of it as a disposition to break when subjected to a suitably strong and sudden stress. So maybe a propensity is a probabilistic disposition of some kind. But making this idea clear is more challenging than it looks. Some people object that, in the absence of a proper metaphysical theory, the term propensity is an empty concept. If believing in propensities amounts to nothing more than believing there is some property of this dice rolling setup which entails that the dice will land two with a certain long run frequency, then this is fine as far as it goes. But it doesn't add to our understanding of what generates those frequencies. It's like saying that I understand how it is that birds know how to build nests by saying that they have an instinct for nest building and defining this instinct as an innate ability to build nests. This language only tricks us into thinking we understand something when we really don't. So these are some objections to propensity interpretations. But the story isn't all bad. If you survey the literature, you'll see there's been quite a bit of work on propensity interpretations that have been rebranded as theories of objective chance. Here I'm thinking of work by David Lewis and Isaac Levi and Hugh Meller, and including more recent work by people like Carl Heffer and Michael Strevens and others. These folks are trying to fit the concept of objective chance into a broader theory of probability that integrates elements of subjective and frequentist approaches, and to show how these various probability concepts are implicitly defined by their relationships to one another. From a philosophical standpoint, I think this work is very interesting but it's still very much a heterogeneous research program with a lot of unresolved problems. From a critical thinking standpoint, however, I don't think that much of this matters. What matters are the broad distinctions, like the distinction between epistemic probability and physical probability, or the distinction between subjective or Bayesian approaches and frequency approaches. Critical thinking about probabilities and probabilistic fallacies requires a certain level of basic philosophical literacy, but I don't think it requires anything beyond what we've covered here.